go. Week eight. Happy Monday. Uh, week nine? Week nine, right? Yeah, yes, week nine. week nine. Not week eight. I'm in the past. Okay. Last stop on our journey to Antarctica is a large colony of Gentoo penguins. Um, if you've ever heard of the uh, Linux operating system, there's a kind of Linux called Gentoo because Linux has a logo of a penguin and Gentoo is a kind of penguin. I assume that's how that came about. But what we see here is a small part of a very large, maybe one-tenth of the, the total penguin colony. And there's some... Uh, uh, seabirds there as well to scavenge bits of fish or whatever else they they can get uh, and these penguins have a bit of a, a hike down to the water to go uh, uh, looking for the fish that they they eat or, or maybe krill shellfish things like that uh, they're uh, an argumentative bunch I was reading that they uh, tend to nest just far enough away from each other so they can guard each other's eggs but can't like poke each other because they, they don't always get along. Uh, plenty, plenty of noise, uh, but they do also court and they, you know, that's how you end up with eggs in, in the first place. Here's a, a picture of one of these Gentoo penguin nests. And while these birds can't actually fly. They are extremely good swimmers and so can get going fast enough that they, they catch some significant air popping up out of the water. All right, that's, that's today's birds. Uh, what questions do you have about the Enigma machine, uh, recursion, things we've, we've been working on? Final project stuff, Ava. Um, I had a question about, I was hoping you would go over a couple more like base case examples because it makes a lot of sense to me when there's a list, it's an empty list, and when there's a string, it's an empty string. But when it's other situations, I'm wondering what other kind of base cases we could have. So, uh, when we're dealing with numbers, as is the case uh, in the greatest common denominator uh, or greatest common divisor uh, problem on the quiz, uh, the like that problem, I have given you the recursive algorithm in English and you're translating it into code. And the base case that describes is when one of our two input numbers is zero, that is our, our base case uh, where we wouldn't make a recursive call. Um, other cases, uh, in some sense, you don't always have to get down to, uh, say, an empty list or an empty string. Uh, if we think back to our reversing a string um, uh, from, from last time, uh, there we made our base case like if s is the empty string or if len of s equals zero. But another way to think about it is if we just have the string a, what is the reverse of the string a? It's unchanged. So we could actually make our base case, if the string is length 1, we just return that string, because we know we don't have to do any work to reverse the string of length 1. Um, those are kind of the, um, kind of, those are by far the most common kind of base cases where we're getting down to 0, or to one thing left, or to an empty list sort of thing. Um, in some cases, uh, we want to do recursion until we get to a certain threshold. So we'll talk about later this week uh, an algorithm for sorting a list, kind of putting a list in sorted order that is recursive. And when that is used in practice, it's efficient if the list is very large, but not if the list is small. Uh, and so you often see something like, if the length of the list is less than a thousand, like use this other, like an, uh, um, a non-recursive uh, sorting algorithm, and only if it's larger than that would you uh, sort it recursively. Uh, and so sometimes you see base cases like that, where it's some sort of cutoff where we want to use some other process than recursion. Other questions?
All right. So today uh, we're, we have a couple uh, a couple new new topics to talk about. Uh, the first set is uh, I would say sort of a side uh, where kind of part of uh, uh, doing our introduction to computer science is to kind of peek inside a lot of the kind of different black boxes that are that are on the computer and, and to think about how they work. <coughs> And one of those is how do we actually store data on a computer? This whole time, since our very first day, we am talking about putting things in the computer's memory. And so today we're, we're going to think a little bit about what that actually means. And kind of one way to uh, approach that is think about, okay, what is the actual technology that we are using. What is the actual like electrical circuits that are being used to store this this memory? And uh, they all these circuits are based on a kind of fundamental unit called a transistor. And uh, the salient fact about a transistor for our purpose today is. that an individual transistor is either going to have high voltage, like electrical current running through it, or low voltage, very little electrical current running through it. And we have uh, uh, billions of, of these transistors within uh, a computer, each of which is kind of high voltage or low voltage at any given point. Gabby? Sorry, is it a transistor or a transistor? Thank you. Transistor. So, because transistors can either be high, have electric current, or low, not have electric current, uh, this translates into a high voltage, we think of that as being a 1, and a low voltage, we think of that being a 0. So now, uh, when we think about the currents, uh, the, the state of some electric current, uh, the state of some electric circuit, we can think of it in terms of ones and zeros. Ones where there's high voltage, zero where there's low voltage. And this means that when we're thinking about how data is stored on a, in a computer's memory, we want to use some sort of a system that uh, involves ones and zeros. And so this brings us to binary numbers. So to back up a bit, uh, does anyone know what it means when I say a base 10 number. Maya? Yes, this, this does involve exponents. Uh, so if I write down the number 534, and I say this is a base 10 number, how does the base tenor or exponents come into it? Max? When it gets, to, so it goes up 1 through 9, and then when it gets, or 0 through 9, and when it gets 9, it adds 1 in front, and then that continues. When that one would hit 10, essentially it goes 1 in, like that? Yeah, yeah we, are, we are carrying over, Jonathan. Uh, with the exponents, like, because of it being based on 10, if you multiply a number in that system by some multi some power of 10, negative or positive, it will move the decimal point. That is, that is related, definitely, that, that if we have 534 and we multiply it by 10, we can just shift it one place over 5,340. And that word place is really what 
I'm getting at here, that if we look at 534, this means that we have five one hundredths, we have three tens, and we have four ones. And all those together give us our number 534. But I can rewrite each of this like hundreds place, tens place, ones place as powers of 10. I can say this is the 10 squared place, this is the 10 to the first place, this is the 10 to the 0 place, because 10 to the 0 is 1. And so that's where we get the term base 10. Each of these places tells us how many of some power of 10 there are, and the base of each of these exponents is 10. And so we have ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and so on. With me so far? Questions on this? So we can have base 10 numbers. And if we can have base 10 numbers, we can have base something else numbers. So what if we had... base 2 numbers. And we had something like 1, 0, 1. I can follow this same pattern to figure out what these places are. I have my 2 to the 0th place, or 1s. I have my 2 to the 1st place, or 2s. I have my two squared place or fours. So given this, what does my base two number one zero one give me in my expressed in base ten? Yeah, I'm seeing people holding up five because we have one two squared, one four plus one one. And kind of Apply, just like we said, we have five hundreds, three tens, four ones, and apply that same idea to our base two number. It's just what each place stands for. We've set, replaced two, the tens, with, with twos. And since the word binary means two, these base two numbers are also referred to as binary numbers. They're numbers that consist of ones and zeros and all expressing some uh, amount of two to some power with each place in that number. Now, this is where we can come back to our transistors where we have high voltage or low voltage. And when we're talking about what is stored in a computer's memory, we talk about bits. We talk about an amount of memory on a computer system is measured in bits, where a bit is a one or zero, a single kind of binary digit, a single transistor, a single circuit that can either have high voltage or low voltage. And so we have this nice connection between kind of the circuits on uh, that our computer is using to store information and this numbering system, this, these binary numbers, that where each digit of these numbers is one or zero. And so each digit of a binary number kind of just maps directly into these computer memory bits that are either one or zero. And so if I want to say, okay, how many bits How many bits 
did it take to write down this number five, what would that be? Yeah, it took three bits, three of these binary digits in order to kind of write down uh, uh, the number five. All right, what are your questions on this so far? All right, so one uh, kind of case where we've seen this come up already is when we were dealing with uh, color values uh, and images. And uh, the way that color is often uh, it is represented and was represented in the images we were working with uh, was uh, what are called twenty four bit color, which means for red for the red value of each pixel, there were eight bits worth of information. Uh, to store that. For green, 8 bits. And for blue, 8 bits. And this is how we get 24, 8 bits for each of our three colors. <coughs> so one thing we might wonder is, well, if we're using 8 bits for red, how many different kind of values for red can we have? So, because that's going to tell us kind of how how fine how fine are the differences between <laughs> colors that this sort of representation could express. So, if we have eight bits, let's consider we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places. So, how many possibilities do we have for this? first binary digit. Yeah, we have uh, one or zero, two different, two different possibilities. So possibilities, we had two. How about for our next digit? Also, also two. And so if we're thinking about how many different combinations could we have with these two digits? We could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And if each could be 0 or 1. So if we multiply these together, that tells us, okay, with these two bits, we have these four, 2 times 2, four different combinations. And we can keep saying, okay, how many possibilities for the third? Two, each of our bits gives us two possibilities. So two times two times two, two to the eighth power is 256 256 possible values. And so we have 256 possible values for red, 256 for green, 256 for blue. And this is how, with our 24-bit color, all together, we have 16,777,216 colors to work with. Which is a lot of different colors. It's probably enough. If we instead said uh, we're going to have three bit color, one bit for red, one bit for blue, one bit for green, then we'd only have how many different colors? We just had three bits. Yeah. 
Yeah, I see. I see some folks holding up, holding up eight. Yeah, we have two times two times two, three bits, two to the third. So uh, the number of bits that we have to to represent information is going to control how many different values we can represent, and that's important when we're when we're dealing with something something like color. Uh, there is a nice demonstration of this. Let me pull it up. <coughs> yes, Wikipedia has a uh, uh, an article about color depth, and this is an image of our our one bit color. We have. There is red or not in this pixel. There is blue or not in this pixel. There's green or not in this pixel. And so basically we get sort of purple or, or black. When we go up to, to two bit, now we have uh, a bit of, bit of green able to, to show up to, that's different from this purple. Um, uh, and as we kind of increase the number of bits that we have for each color, we can start having fine gradations uh, as, say, the leaf transitions with the background, and so the edge becomes much sharper, all the way up to our 24-bit, our 16 million different colors, and it kind of looks like we expect a, uh, an image online to look. Any questions on this? All right, let's practice our binary knowledge. So take a minute to think about what is the number nine can, when we convert it to binary. All right, please brief discussion with your neighbor about how you got to the answer you did. All right, in this case, the majority has it correct. We will do, uh, we will represent 9 as 1001. Zero, zero, one. Uh, if we have our four bits, someone tell me kind of what each bit is, is worth or, or how, we, how we figure out what, what number it gives us. Gabby? Um, do you have four bit spots? Zero to the one, two, 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 just going up by powers of two, and we want one eight and one one. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Let's go the other direction. What is this eight bit number when converted to uh, to decimal? To help you out, I will write down some powers of, of two. All right, again, quick discussion with your neighbors, how you uh, went about doing this conversion. All right, well, we can take this even further because not only can we go from base 10 down to base two, we can go up to base 16, which gets called hexadecimal for decimal 10, hex 6, 16, hexadecimal. And the reason hexadecimal is nice is that with each value a power of 16, that is a power of 2 in a way that 10 powers of 10 are not. That 
when we have a ones, a sixteens, a two hundred and fifty sixes, and and so on. And if each of these places is going to correspond to four bits. Because each place, just like our base two, each place had one of two different values. In base 10, each of our digits has one of 10 different values, zero through nine. In base 16, each of our digits has one of 16 different values. And that we know to make 16 different values, that would take four different four different bits, as we'd have two possibilities times two times two times two for our four bits would let us make 16 different combinations. The wrinkle when we get to hexadecimal is, well, we need to have, be able to have like 16 different digits in one spot. And so we count up 0 to 9, that's 10 different digits. So we need to come up with 6 more digits in order to have 16 different possibilities for, for one digit. And we just start using letters, because why not? They're not? They weren't being used in, in 0 through 9. So then we have A, B, C, D, E, and F as our 6 additional digits. So if I have the number 10 in base 10, base 16, we write that as A. We count up to 9, and then A is 10, D is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, F is 15. So the main reason that I bring up hexadecimal is that we commonly encounter it when we're writing down colors. Why colors? Because each of our colors is 8 bits, which means each of our our red value we can express as two hexadecimal digits because each of those is four bits. And we see this when we look at something like this color picker uh, that, that Google presents us, that we can see the red, green, blue values down here. Is that text too small? Can folks see? All right, we can see that there's 252 out of uh, uh, 255 red, 186 uh, green, 3 blue, and we also see that there's a hex representation because a lot of uh, different applications, web browsers, uh, uh, PGL underneath represent colors in this sort of shorthand where 252 gets converted to FC, the two-digit hexadecimal number FC, 186 to the number BA, and 3 to the number 03. And so uh, wanted to, um, and so the, my, the main takeaway is just that when you see kind of quantities written using, where F's, E's, B's, A's are, are sprinkled in, think hexadecimal, base 16, uh, and you're likely to encounter this when when doing stuff with color, particularly if it's on a on a web page. Any questions on that? All right. So that's that's our the end of our diversion down into into numbering systems. Uh, I now have a code. I guess I'll do it on here. Code writing exercise for you to kind of warm up for our next topic. 
I would like you to write a uh, contains function that takes in a list v and an element x and this should return true if x is an element of v return uh, false otherwise and my challenge to you is uh, do not use the in operator so we know that we can use just like x in v that would do this contains function for us and now we want to try and write uh, our, our own contains function that does not use in um, and this will will lead us into our uh, the, the next idea we're talking about so work with the folks around you to uh, code up should take four or five lines of code to write this contains function <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> all right so interest of time let's let's uh work through this together so uh first thing i want to do in my loop is to check if my current element of my list is equal to the one i'm i'm looking for someone suggest how how i could do that Exactly. Um, if element equals equals x, return true. Exactly. That if the element I'm on matches the one I'm looking for, then I have found it, and I want the function to return true. So I'm almost done with my contains function. Only thing I have to, to figure out is I need it to return false in the case where it doesn't find x uh, doesn't find yeah doesn't find x anywhere in v anyone have a, a suggestion for how I could get it to, to return false when that happens Emma I like it that we put a return false outside of our for loop so that only when we get through the entire loop, only once we've checked every single element in our list and not returned true for any of them, because remember when we hit that return true, it would end the function, we would stop checking. Only once we've gone through all that do we know, okay, we never found it, so we can return false. Any questions on this one? So a point I want to make about this uh, function here, this contains, is that we are essentially We're performing a search. We are kind of venturing forth and finding uh, uh, a particular thing we're looking for. In this case, we are searching through our list V for a particular uh, element X. And another kind of uh, search-like activity would be uh, a number guessing game, something that we've also looked at. So. Uh, if we were to play a game and I said, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100, uh, and every time you guess, I'm going to say, yes, that's the number, or no, that's not the number. Anyone, what, what strategy would you use to uh, try and, and figure out what number I'm thinking of? Here. Start at the beginning, go through all the numbers. Yeah, you'd be like, is it one? No. Is it two? No. Is it three? No. And go from there. 
And that is in its own way a search for the number that I'm thinking of. And both this code that we just wrote for contains and this sort of uh, guessing, just like start at the beginning and guess every number, would be called a, a linear search algorithm. Just we're just going to try each one in order. When it came to contains, we started at the beginning of the list, checked each one. Is it the one we're looking for? In this guessing game, start at one and go up from there. What if I changed the rules of the game and said, OK, now every time that you guess, I will tell you whether the number I'm thinking of is higher or lower than the one that you guessed. Sam? And I would take one of a small number. If you say higher, I would go for a mid-range number. If you keep saying higher, I would go towards a high-range number. And vice versa, I went to the mid-range and you said lower. And I would narrow it down between those two. Yeah, some sort of like kind of jumping around to sort of narrow down um, uh, the kind of which numbers we're, we're looking at. Uh, so I don't have a suggestion for like a specific place we might start. You might start at 50, and then if it's higher or lower, go to like 75 or 25, and then go to the middle number each time. Yeah, we if we go to the middle, that's going to let us rule out an entire half of the possibilities. And if you guess 50 and I say, well, it's higher, you know, you don't need to ever guess any of the numbers less than 50. 50. You know, kind of reduce the numbers that are left to guess by half. And then if you guess 75, and I say lower, well, now you know it's between 51 and 74. And every time I give you a clue, you can throw away half the numbers that were possibilities before. And so that's really nice. And it would be... Uh, uh, useful if we were able to apply that same sort of try the middle and go and kind of rule out half the possibilities sort of strategy to searching for an element of a list. But when we're searching for an element of a list, we don't have anyone to, to like tell us the, the guess is you need to, to, to look higher or, or lower. So we're going to need for it to be some property of a list that we use uh, to, to help us know where to look. So can anyone, th uh, uh, I'd like you to take a couple minutes, brainstorm with your neighbors. Uh, is there any way we could organize a list, say a list of numbers, such that we could use this kind of uh, uh, strategy where we try the middle and then we can rule out half the possibilities. So brainstorm with your neighbors for, for a couple minutes about that. All right. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're done with our, our code writing for the day, so it would be okay to, to close, close the laptops. Uh, any... Uh, any ideas uh, come up in your in your brainstorming about what we could, how we could organize a list to help us use this sort of uh, jumping halfway strategy? So, if we have. We think about this in terms of a list with some number of slots in it. Let's see, I drew one with, with nine slots. Perfect. And I want to say <clears throat> check the middle and say compare what I the, the number I'm looking for. So I have If I'm looking for a target, and let's say x, I'll use x to represent the number here. 
I'm going to say uh, I'm going to compare target to x, and if target is less than x, I want to know I only need to look at one half of this list, and if target is greater than x, I know I only need to look at the other half. Uh, what would need to be true about the elements in this list? For me, it will say, okay, if target is less than x, I only need to consider these these four. David? It would have to be in order from least to greatest. Yes, our list would need to be in sorted order. Because the reason that that number guessing game, you knew to try 50, and then if the number you were looking for is greater to try 75, is I told you the numbers are be the numbers between 1 and 100. And there's an order to them, so you know which is less than greater. So in a list, if we know how long it is, and we know it's in order, then we can try the middle, and if what we're looking for is less than the thing in the middle, we know we, that all the numbers that are less than the middle are over here in the lower half of the list. And likewise, all the numbers that are greater than x must be on the right half if this list is in sorted order. Does that make sense? Why, why sorted would, would help this? So we can actually code this up. And it has a fancy name. It is binary search. Again, binary means two. And in this strategy, we're kind of dividing the list we're searching into two parts, and then only searching one half of it. And then dividing that list into two parts, and only searching one half of it, and, and so on. So if I were to define a binary search uh, uh, function that took in uh, v and an x like our contains, I'll name them. Uh, <laughs> nums and target actually, so it's a little easier to tell what the code is doing. To start out with, uh, one way of, of implementing this strategy is to keep track of the indexes of sort of the portion of the list that I'm currently searching. So I can sort of keep track. Okay, here's the low index that I'm searching. And here's the high index that I'm searching, which gives me this spot is in the middle between them. And then were target to be less than x, I know that the number I'm looking for is in this half. So I could then say, OK, high, my high index is now here. So indicating that this is the portion of the list between low in, the low index and the high index. So like I did on the board, I'll start my low index at 0, the first index, and my high index at the length of nums minus 1, at the index at the very end of the list. And then I want to kind of, in a loop, I want to repeat my process of kind of searching uh, through through this list uh, while I haven't found what I'm looking for. And one way I can tell when I'm done searching is if there are no more entries in my list between my low index and my high index. Like if there, there are no numbers between them, I have kind of searched all the places that I, I've ruled out all the possibilities where it could be. So I might say while my low index is less than or equal to my high index. So while there's at least one number that is within this range of index, once low kind of goes past high or high goes past low, that's going to be my signal. All right, I've, I've searched all the places there are to search. So I need to get the index in the middle of low and high. A nice way to do this is to say low plus high divided by 2. Except 
And this issue of, well, what if it's like this picture here, low is zero, high is three, and I do zero plus three divided by two and get 1.5. That's, that's not, I can't index the list at 1.5. So I'm just going to round this down because that's, it's fine to always round down. Uh, uh, it will kind of uh, keep the keep the search going. So I will just do double slash to say divide by two and throw away the the part at the, after the decimal. So three uh, with this integer division divided by two would just give me one. And so that's going to be my my mid index. Then I will get the element out of my list at that index. And at this point, I'm going to start checking what, how this item, this thing at the mid index, relates to the number I'm looking for. So just like in contains, uh, if the item equals the thing I'm looking for, then I'll return true. I have found it. Else, I now need to, if, if it didn't match, I now need to decide like which half of my list am I going to search next, the lower half or the upper half. So I can say if uh, target is less than item, I should search the lower half of my list. And like I did on the board, I can do that by moving my high index to the top of my of my lower half because that's going to change the middle is now the middle of this lower half and I can kind of keep moving high uh, down if it keeps being uh, less than, than the item I find in the middle and so for this I'll set high is my midpoint minus one so I know it's not the midpoint and so the the greatest thing it could be is kind of one below the midpoint else target must be greater than than the item and so for this I want to move the low index up to kind of the bottom of, of the, the top half of the remaining possibilities and I can say low equals middle plus one and I've moved low to I know it's not the middle and the smallest thing it could be is like one spot up from the middle and again, just like contains, if I get through this whole loop, searching all these midpoints, never find it, I know it's, oops, it's just not in the list, and I can return false. All right, what are your, what are your questions on, on this uh, code version of our, our binary search? Sammy. So you can't use this place in this one? Uh, I could absolutely do this using slices. I just chose to do it kind of keeping track of these, these indexes. One uh, sort of aspect of this is not all programming languages have list slicing the way Python does. And so if you were to see binary search written in some other language, you'll, you'd very likely see it written kind of this way, keeping track of, of indexes. So, uh, but yes, instead of reassigning low and high, I could just keep slicing the list into these smaller portions. Yeah, maybe. Do, do we have to order the, the, the nums list, or it doesn't matter what order it is in? That's an excellent question. Do we need to order the, the nums list? Uh, no, we will assume nums is sorted in ascending order, from smallest to largest. This would not work if that's not true. Uh, and it would also, as we'll see when we talk about sorting, it will be more work to put it in sorting order, in sorted order, than it would be to just do a linear search and check each element once. So this binary search is really only a win for us if, say, we need to sort a list once and then search it a lot, or if it's already sorted for some other reason. And then we can, then we can binary search. Other questions?
Huh. Is there any way you could show us like how that would be faster than the other one, the linear one? Yes. Uh, I probably can do that. Um, let me call this search two dot pi, and this is this is something I uh, that's in the the notes for Friday that I didn't that I I didn't get to, um, but if I have a terminal, uh, I can run Python three dash m time it to tell Python to time some uh, operation for me, and I can tell it to do some code as setup. So I'm going to say import uh, from search to uh, contains and binary search. And then I'm also going to create a list called A, which is the numbers from, uh, I don't know, 1 to 1 million, or 0 to, to, to 999,000. And then I say the code that I'd like you to time is contains of uh, my list A, and let's say um, uh, 800,000. So um, oh, I just I'm going to import these things uh, from search2. from search to import contains. I'll get it eventually. Oh, this needs to be in notes. All right, so I run this and it said, okay, I did 10 loops. So it tried each of these contains uh, 10 times and it did that five times. And so it, does, it tried it 10 times, took the average of that and did that five times and took the best one of those five. And it said it took 20 milliseconds, 20 thousandths of a second to run this contains. And if I do it with binary search, it did 100,000 loops and it took 3.17 microseconds, 3.17 millionths of a second. So binary search, instead of, instead of having to search 800,000 places, uh, search something like 20 places. And so it was just thousands of times faster. This also kind of gives us some intuition for how we would decide kind of which code is more efficient. We try it a bunch of times, time how long each of those tries takes, and take the average of those. Okay. So is this the kind of stuff that's like done in data structures, like to make things more efficient? Uh, a lot of part of data structures is less of this kind of, uh, uh, so a lot of part of data structures is thinking about how can we provide these operations efficiently? How can we search efficiently? How can we retrieve data efficiently? How can we add and remove things to our data structure efficiently? Uh, and as we'll talk about later this week, there's a sort of more mathematical, theoretical way of analyzing an algorithm and expressing how efficient it is, as opposed to just like picking a particular input and, and timing how long that takes. All right, let's, we have a last few minutes, so one last bit of practice. How many steps would it take to find 15 in this list here using binary search where a step is like try a spot and then <coughs> it's like one time around that, that while loop in our code of like checking a spot and then adjusting which part of the list we're, <coughs> we're checking. Uh, please discuss with your, your neighbors uh, which numbers binary search would, would check uh, when searching this list. I have some movement toward two. That's, that's good. That's how many uh, things we'll check. We'll start in the middle. Nine is our, our fourth element, the middle of our seven element list. We'll see that it's greater. Then check the middle of this upper three, which will be 15. That's our two steps. That'll do it for today. Uh, quiz due uh, tonight. 
I have office hours uh, tomorrow night in the lab, and I'll see you Wednesday.